Could all the real libertarians please stand up? I am fine. I'm, I'm a fan. No, seriously, where, where have you guys all gone? Barely a day goes by without hearing of some group or another splitting off from the libertarian movement. Some have turned into Bernie bros like Daily Beast writer Andrew Carell. Others have just settled as Republicans like former Libertarian Party presidential candidate Austin Peterson. Out of those supporters, 98% or more said run as a Republican. Others have even become full-on social justice warriors like Will Wilkinson of the Niskanen Institute. And of course, many former libertarians are turning to nationalism, and even to its most extreme manifestations in the alt-right. It's this last group, of course, that seems to be causing the biggest headache for establishment-minded libertarians, with the never-Trumpers now claiming there's a libertarian pipeline to the alt-right. Libertarians reply saying there is no pipeline between their ideology and any movement, let alone the alt-right. And you know what? They're completely correct about that, because you don't need a pipeline to get people off the Titanic. And I'm not just being facetious, I mean that. Libertarianism has been shipwrecked. Not because former libertarians have suddenly decided they love massive intrusive government. Suspicion of authority has, if anything, gotten stronger in the past few years. Trump's slashing of regulations is making the US economy boom. Cultural libertarianism is on the ascendant, and you'd think the ideology would be raking in supporters. But instead, even the longtime supporters are totally abandoning it. Just look at, well, me. To the surprise of some people, I still hold most of the exact same values I held when I ran as a candidate for the Libertarian Party of Canada back in 2015. Yet I want nothing to do with the movement styling itself as libertarianism, and they sure as hell want nothing to do with me. When I was kicked out of the party, it was done under the banner of Libertarianism 2.0, the slightly more cringeworthy cousin of Atheism Plus, twice removed. Yeah, the same social justice infiltration that caused Atheism Plus to destroy the atheist movement has taken a hold in libertarianism. You have feminist libertarian writers publicly shaming libertarian men for tweeting memes in order to make the movement safer for women. You have Reason Magazine saying that Christina Hofstummer's freedom feminism has nothing to offer feminism or libertarianism. And you have trend-chasing racial masochists who try to force libertarianism and Black Lives Matter together on the basis that the defense of liberty can't do without identity politics. All things considered, it's no surprise that the only people left in the libertarian movement act like this. Goodbye. This is not the ideology of Friedman Mises or Hayek or even John Stuart Mill or John Locke. So how did a movement that stands for so many of the values Western civilization was built on devolve into nothing but a seastead of misfits who are as divorced from reality as they are from social graces? Well, it started with libertarians' increasingly codependent and clingy love affair with people and institutions simply because they have money. Professions of affection towards big business and an insatiable fetish for corporate power and wealth have alienated many former libertarians from the movement. In America, corporations are people legally speaking. Imagine you had a movement dedicated to treating these people as victims like the left's treatment of women and black people, and you have modern establishment libertarianism. All they're missing is a hashtag like hashtag stock ticker lives matter. In practice, this means that like their PC cousins, modern libertarians will twist everything, including the words of their supposed intellectual idols, in order to protect sacred corp. Take Ayn Rand. Supposedly, Rand is the ultimate apologist for big business in the libertarian canon. But if you actually read Atlas Shrugged, you'll see that Rand attacks business people who rely on government subsidies at least as hard as she attacks envious anti-capitalist intellectuals. In fact, one of her biggest villains in the book is the corrupt steel magnate named Orrin Boyle, who can only keep his business open because of government help. Of course, he masks this by lecturing the book's heroes for being selfish. So in other words, Rand tells us to be wary of a subsidy-guzzling monster who sanctimoniously and hypocritically tells others, don't be evil. Who does that sound like? Gee, maybe 
Google, Facebook, and Amazon, who libertarians seem to be doing plenty of white knighting for these days. Some right-wing populists have even advocated using the power of the state to force private tech companies to be run like quasi-governmental public utilities. Since it has the power to censor the internet, Google should be regulated like the public utility it is. None of this is a principled commitment to capitalism. It is a religious attachment to capital itself and a sycophantic defense of those with capital. Now, once they've finished their daily ritual prayers to Wall Street, I know that establishment libertarians will probably respond saying, gee, Lauren, if you care so much about what libertarian intellectuals say, why do you ignore them on free trade and immigration? First off, I'm pretty sure only someone as stupid as Kim Jong-un believes the idea that free trade is bad all the time. If you could get every single country on Earth to let down their trade barriers completely and quit manipulating their fiat currency, you'd probably have a more economically efficient system. But that's like saying socialism would work great if only everyone would stop being so selfish. It's never gonna happen. Countries profit massively from trade where one side is completely open and the other is protectionist. Even the founding fathers do that. The main reason Hamilton and Jefferson used free trade rhetoric was so that they could export cheap goods from America, meanwhile supporting protectionist policies that limit the influx of goods. Not for economic reasons, but to protect sovereignty. There was, however, one group that was against protectionist trade. But if you're a mainstream libertarian who's more terrified of being called racist by your liberal friends than just about anything else, it would be pretty awkward to worship the southern slave owners that opposed protectionist policies towards the wages of northern industrial workers. Policies they didn't really need because their workers were slaves. Abe Lincoln is lucky Reason Magazine wasn't around in the 1860s or America might never have stopped importing black people to do cheap agricultural work. Speaking of, let's talk about immigration. Of course, big business apologists would support open borders. Borders only help the poor, the moochers who can't afford to donate to their think tanks or fly out to their regional conferences. And it stops the cheap flow of their Russian hookers, rich foreigners, and Mexican nannies. So you'll repeatedly hear, hey guys, the free movement of people is great. Cheap labor helps the economy grow and lowers prices for all Americans. Plus, having border controls isn't very freedom-loving of us. We gotta let everybody come to this great nation. And all the while, they somehow forget that we live in democracies with vast welfare states. And that even libertarian hero Milton Friedman agreed that both democracy and welfare collapse when you let the whole world cross your borders. This is where some libertarians would say, get rid of the welfare state. Illegal immigrants are barred from using the welfare anyway, so why does it matter? Well, they still have kids who are citizens, and pro-welfare politicians will always find ways to sneak them into the voting booth. In fact, even if you did hypothetically destroy the welfare state, in a democracy, large companies, NGOs, and any interest group can literally just import voters to get their way, and good luck shrinking the state after that. So as a desperate final breath, some libertarians will just go full anarchist and say, get rid of the government totally, then we can have open borders. Okay, great. How? By donating to Cato? By following reason on Twitter? I mean, sure, it's a nice idea in theory, but without some Fallout-style catastrophe, it ain't happening anytime soon. And no, North Korea, that is not an invitation. The purest libertarian position on free trade and borders really speak to an adherence to an abstract politics of principle devoid of any real world context. Their ideology relies on every nation in the world having libertarian policies and every culture in the world understanding and living by libertarian values. But outside the reason Cato YAL Beltway axis, where people have not washed down every axiom of libertarian theory with a river of Kool-Aid, people realize that a free culture needs borders to protect that freedom from cultures hostile to freedom. They understand that a ragtag team of nationless individualists won't be able to stop an invasion from Russia or China marching as one nation. I'm not gonna pretend to have all the answers. I want it all too. I want no government, with no fear of authoritarian cultures coming in and creating a worse dictatorship. But in our current state, that doesn't seem possible. So I'm left in the same camp as many people who have abandoned establishment libertarians, but are still hypercritical of government. I'm going to fight for the things I believe will have a genuine pragmatic impact on the size of the state instead of purity spiraling. 
closing the borders while the welfare state exists, trying to keep out authoritarian cultures, promoting alternative currencies, fighting for lower taxes, opposing restrictions on our free speech even if they do come from crony corporations. These are real things we can do, and that's why many libertarians are tired of the establishment movement not offering real solutions or rejecting them because of their pragmatism. And really, who can blame them? The only people left who can possibly call themselves purist libertarians are people who think that thousands of years of culture conditioning in nature can be overridden by 200 page Facebook rants about the NAP. They have this absurdly optimistic view of human nature in common with neoconservatives, except neoconservatives tend to prefer to invade cultures they disagree with, then shoot the people who resist, whereas establishment libertarians, on the other hand, like to be invaded by the cultures that disagree with them, and then the only violence they're capable of is making those people want to kill themselves with their pointless utopian ranting. Whew. That was probably a little harsh, but it's not easy to watch a movement kill itself after you've put so much time and energy into promoting its ideals and believing in it. So this has been a long time coming and needed to be said, and I hope some of you guys enjoyed the video. If you didn't, well, there's plenty of space in the comment section to scream status at me, so I look forward to reading that. But uh, I, I guess I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.